Good morning, everyone. So, um, so last Friday's, I just wanted to clarify, I'm sorry about last, last Friday. I was, uh, I was really under the weather, not COVID. I don't know what it was, but I was barely functional. I recorded a lecture, I tried to do it synchronously and a couple people were on it and I was like, I can't do this, which reminds me, I think there's still might be notices that the lecture was canceled on the door out here. Some people missed it because of that. <laughs> so, but there, my point is that there is a lecture online that I managed to record on Trout. And it's an important lecture. You should check it out. You'll, you'll need to know that information. Okay, somebody finally took it down. And so please take some time to go through that information. Um, uh, and, and I realized that the quiz from that day was a little bit brutal. Um, a lot of people like uh, panicking in the ranks. There were some logic problems tacked in with taxonomy. And really, I just wanted to offer that, you know, there's only a couple points to quizzes. There's no, there's no reason everyone can't get 100% on all the quizzes and participation because we offer extra credit. There's lots of opportunities. I expect everyone to tap out on it, but for a couple extra points lost maybe, I hope that I got your attention in terms of understanding the taxonomy. We've spent a bunch of time on it. And so it's really important to me, hopefully to you as well, that you understand those relationships and what constitute ancestral and derived characteristics and which of those derived characteristics fuel an understanding of um, what we call taxa. Now there's some that are just, these, what we call these garbage can taxa. Obviously you can't, you know, we kind of throw them in there, but there are some key things like for the minnows, for the salmonids, that we really understand, you know, why we lump them together. It's for good reason. And again, in, in, in our class here in the lecture, you just need to know those characteristics down to the order. If you're in lab, you need to know families and in some cases species. So that was, that was the point of that. Um, and I will try my best to make on the midterm to make those questions broad enough and uh, broad enough so that you have multiple ways of answering them and uh, considering it. Those are very, very narrow questions. If I asked you anything like that, it would probably be a multiple choice on the exam. Uh, in fact, the exam itself will consist, the midterm will be, in next slide, I'll talk about that in the next slide. Uh, also, I uh, just want to reiterate, so that's, that's the lecture and quiz that we had, a little bit of a bloodbath, but we'll recover. The final paper is due on Friday at midnight, so hopefully you're well on your way. The midterm, there's a mistake in the syllabus I just found out. The midterm is on Wednesday, not on Monday. I don't give exams on Monday, cruel and unusual. So um, it's, it's Wednesday and I'll change it in the syllabus so that it states that Wednesday. Um, and then a little bit extra reading. Hopefully you've taken a look at the state of the Salmonids, uh, which is up on Canvas. And I added something about, it's, you know, it's titled Salmon People. It's a discussion of a, um, of a Native American tribe that has a relationship with salmon and they've been doing a lot of advocacy for it to preserve their cultural heritage as well as the population. And take a look at that, it's a short read. Uh, I think it'd be a useful background for what we've been talking about over the past couple of days and today. And so regarding, yeah. Oh yeah? Anyone else have that experience? Huh, I'll take a look at it. I'll, I'll re-upload it, thank you. So today I'm gonna to talk, whoops, there we are. So the midterm, um, I'll cover everything through today's lecture basically through salmonids or salmoniformes. Um, you can expect multiple choice, fill in, short answer and long answer questions. It should take about an hour. Um, quick straw poll. I intended this to be taken after hours uh, on your own time. Is there any preference in this class for having time in the class to take it or saving it? I mean, I can do both, but is there any, pre is there any strong feeling that you want to be in class to take it? Who, who, would, who, who would prefer just to have it be take home? Okay, easy, that's what we'll do then. 
<laughs> and if you have questions, um, it's Wednesday, so you can come to office hours. <laughs> you can, I'll probably do virtual office hours, so you can uh, email me virtually or text me. Uh, it's an open book, so your resources are, are available. I'll get to you in a sec that your resources are, you know, you can use your resources. It's open discussion, so if you have a study group, uh, you can discuss it. Um, don't use Wikipedia. <laughs> don't use Chegg. <laughs> They'll lead you astray. Some hack guy who flunked out of fish biology is now like working for Chegg to do some. I looked at some of that stuff. Oh my God, so bad. So it won't really help you address the sort of regional questions that I'm probably going to ask you on this on this midterm. Okay, so work with each other. You can have discussions. I noticed that the discussion chat room thing on on the classroom on the on Canvas never gets used. You could use that as a resource. Why not? Um, you could you could start up a, a Discord chat if you want. Why not? You had a question. Just just by midnight. But you know that said, you know you want to study for it <laughs> because the questions. If you don't have some kind of integrative understanding, some of these questions that that require you to kind of integrate stuff vertically are going to be really elusive to you, right? So you you want to prep and understand the lecture material. It's just stuff that we covered in the lecture. It's not stuff from the other readings, stuff we haven't talked about specifically. Those are for background. They might inform your answers, but it's really stuff in lecture, okay? Another question over here? No? Yes? Um, yeah, it will. And they'll be randomized, so they come up at different times. I know, yeah, that's the, that's the do you have a question? Okay, anyone else? Wendy, did you have a question? No, okay. Let's move on. Let's talk more about Salmonidae. Salmonidae is sort of the exception to the, 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 the rule about orders. And we're really kind of drilling into the Salmonidae as a group. So while you don't need to know scientific names necessarily, you should know about the species and their ecology and their evolution. So um, I want to start off a little bit just talking about salmon culture and art. Salmon culture is very, very deep along the northern Pacific Rim. And I think in California, you know, we don't have much of a sense of it anymore uh, because we haven't grown up with it. But this is the, an example of a species that's very, um, it's really charismatic and it, and it does its thing in clear water oftentimes. And so, and, and it's had a huge economic and social impact on our culture. And, um, it's hard to relay the importance of that because of shifting baselines. Um, you know, up in the Pacific Northwest still, every elementary school has a creek going behind it where there's seal, steelhead or coho running up it. And they have like a, you know, like a salmon culture program or something like that. Uh, in California, those are like fairly few and far between. So I don't know if you've had any exposure to it, but the magnitude of it is kind of hard to relate. I'm going to try here in just a second. There is really nothing like, um, you, so you hear stories. You hear stories about, oh, you know, the old timers talk about, oh, I crossed this river on the backs of the salmon spawning upstream, or I took a pitchfork and I shoveled them into a wheelbarrow and carved them off and smoked them. Well, I have to tell you, those stories are true. <laughs> I don't know about walking on the backs of the salmon across them, but I mean, I've been in streams where you can reach down and you can grab a salmon. It's right there. And I've gone swimming with them, schooling around me, this ball of vibrant color uh, up in Alaska. It still happens. And Alaska was really kind of a, a small fraction of what we had at one time in California as the species have moved up. And it's, um, it's just the, the, it must have been a really different landscape to have millions of fish, like on these coastal streams, in these uh, headwater old growth forests, to have thousands and thousands and thousands of fish swimming up a tiny little sub creek. And it impacted things ecologically, provided a huge source of nutrients, a huge source of productivity for these forests. Somebody, uh, I think Veers did, from UC Davis did a study on the impact of returning salmon carcasses, the stable isotope from, the stable isotopes were detected in vineyards, so in wine. So just the return of salmon essentially produced so many nutrients that it got picked up by vineyards that are now planted adjacent to these creeks and watered with the water from them. So, um, so on so many levels, you know, both ecological, natural, economic, social, and culturally, uh, 
salmon had a huge impact on our culture. And, and I wanted to just kind of impart a little bit of that. Uh, and part of it is just the commercial industry, you know? So like up until, up until pretty recently, you could go out to Noyo Harbor up in Fort Bragg and you could see a fishing fleet that looked a lot like that up and through, up and through the eighties. I was actually offered a chance to, to work on a boat up there in like 1986 or 87. And I passed it up and it turned out to be the highliner for the season. It was like one of the dumbest things I've ever done because they made so much money. And it was a bunch of like gentlemen fishermen, like scholarly fishermen, it was sort of, uh, it's just like a time when like working class and intellectuals were working together in the, in the industry. It was, it was a very interesting time. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a sail fleet from the mouth of the Columbia River up in the upper right-hand corner. Um, the last sail fleet, sail powered fleet uh, in the US occurred in, um, in Bristol Bay up in Alaska. And in the 1950s, it was, it was blown out by a big storm. And they replaced it with these, these little tin bathtubs, these aluminum bathtubs that they now use in the Bristol Bay fishery, which is one of, still one of the most important uh, sockeye salmon fisheries uh, in the world. Um, and then anyway, so I just, you know, the, 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 the fact that this existed had a big influence on our culture. And it led to these, you know, these people like Freeman House here, who wrote Totem Salmon, who was a fisher himself. He, uh, you know, he got very involved in this whole movement of like watershed. It led to, you know, discussions about watershed connectivity and resources and protecting the resource and also connecting the cultural resource. And it spawned books like Salmon Nation by Seth Zuckerman and had people working with tribal groups to, uh, to try to restore the resource, leading to festivals. The Matoll Restoration Council up in Humboldt County was kind of a leader in terms of trying to get loggers or people with lands who were logging it, fishers, locals, hippies, rednecks, all on the same page about taking care of the streams. Because, you know, the hippies came in and they were very righteous about it. And they were like, hey, you know, you're, you know, got to protect the salmon. You're, you know, we're ruining the land logging for salmon. Well, it turns out that they were building like these old funky dirt roads that were dumping a whole bunch of sediment into the creeks. And so that was interfering with spawning habitat. So everybody had to come to the table and put their, put their um, you know, stop shooting and stop fighting at the local bar and put their differences aside and kind of come to solutions for this. And so culturally, you know, on a social, cultural, political level, it was really the underpinning of a lot of social movements in, in California and the Northwest. Uh, and this is like, a, this is a bit of salmon art in uh, Olympia. Uh, with a bunch of kids put together a, a kind of mosaic of a, of a, um, a, uh, of a returning salmon uh, talking about habitat. And this was, these were put up all over Olympia as trying to engage people. And it's just something that's part of the culture. It's very pervasive up there. But I wanted to say in terms of the art, it's in terms of the culture, this is very, very deep. It goes back at least 10,000 years. Um, and fishing tech, these are um, on, the, on the left, this is a hoop man working a fish weir that was put on the Trinity River. On the right is Yurok, who's um, working with a plunge net uh, on the river, on the Klamath. Um, and they had, so they had pretty elaborate technologies that supported this wealth. And these were salmon culture because it provided so much uh, resources for those, for those groups. And, um, and it's still alive today. You know, these cultures still embrace that, uh, particularly the Hoopa have been fighting to save the Klamath run for, for decades now against kind of incredible odds. But the same traditions of potlatch, there they're smoking salmon up in the upper left-hand corner. Potlatch type uh, event is going in the, in the lower right-hand corner and in the middle celebrating salmon return. And there's people harvesting on the river in the same old traditional way that they've been doing for a long time. And so I just wanna um, mention that this, this, you know, this deep attachment to the resource translated into cultural artifacts that we rarely see except in museums now. In the Haida up in uh, the Haida nation up in uh, British Columbia, um, the art is reflected on all the, you know, on everything, architecture, on their boats, on the totems that sort of act as like family or clan crests in front. Uh, this on the left is a salmon log. Presumably, it's a little hard for me to see. Presumably, this is a depiction of a salmon in the characteristic Northwest style, Native uh, American style of having uh, these really broad barriers that are sort of carved in and then painted with faces and spiritual representations, you know, depicted inside a larger organism, sort of layers, just like it's done vertically 
on the totem poles from bottom to top, you have different iconic characters, both from family histories and from legends uh, and stories. Oftentimes they would integrate all of that sort of not vertically, but internally, sort of in a nested fashion. And some beautiful art came out of that. Uh, this is the Kwak Yudel group also up in uh, British Columbia. Uh, this is a, uh, this is a, um, a button blanket made with, um, uh, clam or with uh, shells, uh, mussel shells or um, clam shells. And these are two Samonid depictions. Uh, in the middle is a bent box, a bent wood box. So they had pretty, they had amazing um, woodworking technology by notching and steaming wood. They figured out how to bend boxes into, into a shape and then carve a top on it. These are infused with Samonid designs. This is actually a different, this is probably a Sculpin representation on the boat here. Uh, and this is really cool because it's a decaying salmon. It's a it's a salmon skeleton on the um, on the front of a longhouse, and I don't know what the one in the upper hand, right hand corner is. Maybe it's a sculpin too, but it's very cool. And then finally, Tlingit. Not finally, but another group is Tlingit. I just wanted to put again this picture up here of the longhouse because it's so awesome. And then here is different fish. This is probably a halibut uh, depicted on this front. And then a totem with, uh, I think this is frog woman with two salmon that she's holding. So that culture persisted and this is still, you know, these houses are still up there in various degrees of decay. Uh, they really weren't abandoned until the late 19th century, early 20th century. And they're made of cedar primarily. So they've resisted a lot of decay. Um, and this is translated into uh, modern, represent modern art as well. So the sort of traditions uh, continue uh, using some of the similar iconography and then modified into different depictions. There's a salmon in the upper left-hand corner, a sculpin, eagle, orca up in the right. This is a Haida dog salmon. And this one here, which is uh, from a story of Salmon Boy, and it's showing a, a spawning event, and it's tied into a, a human interaction in that. Cool stuff that gets sold through art galleries and whatnot. Uh, this is uh, done by somebody from the Lower Elwha uh, Clallam. Tribe. Upayuk Moor is from the Yupik tribe. She still paints uh, traditional themes. Uh, and then people have picked this up <laughs> in mainstream culture. You can see it's really cool because it's street art, but it shows it shows the same kind of visuals that are from traditional stuff. So anyway, that's that's the art history for today. Uh, talking about just deep culture. So let me uh, give you a little more background on some on as you had some from Jacob, uh, but I'm going to, you know, in terms of the conservation, but let me get more down to the biology after that long side discourse there. Um, so the, the most recent glaciation in the Pleistocene ended about 10,000 years ago. And it, uh, as it receded, the Salmonids that were there in the region, these cold water, somewhat anadromous fishes, we're able to move into these newly opening niches. Same story that we talked about with the trout, if you saw that lecture. And so um, as a result, there was this sort of premium uh, on being able to uh, have an adaptable life history pattern. So opportunistic feeding, adaptable behavior, and the capability of moving from freshwater to soft water, salt water became desirable characteristics because of the changing nature of the landscape. Not only are we on this tectonic edge of the West Coast where things like rivers can appear and disappear in a massive earthquake event, um, but the changing climate was really dramatic. And so fishes that were able to handle it, including the change, the annual changes, as well as decadal changes and longer range patterns, the fishes that could accommodate that by being plastic enough to move into these opening and closing environments became successful. And this kind of characteristic, the salmons have a rich genetic, they have a rich genome, which allows them to be that kind of plastic organism that can move into um, coastal headwater streams and, and also major rivers. And so for participation credit today, should be up. Uh, I want you to just write a few sentences on why salmonids are so diverse widespread and abundant in California. And while you're writing that, or maybe you're gonna put it in your back pocket to write before midnight, 
I will proceed to answer the question. <laughs> so I talked about the, uh, the glacial period that ended about 10,000 years ago. And uh, you can see the whole, um, the Northeast United States was pretty much entirely covered by glaciation. Um, but, and, and also as well, I should say the, the um, you know, Alaska, at least on the coast, uh, you know, down through Canada, very much locked in by glaciers. But there was this giant barrier, the, the mountain range that extended from the, from the Rockies on up through Alaska is essentially one continuous mountain range, which sort of kept some of that Arctic glaciation uh, in this basin here. And only the peaks, especially down in California, the very, uh, the very highest elevations um, became glaciated. And the coast, in a lot of cases, was open. And, um, and that, again, led for this really heterogeneous environment where you had these species that were already established, older, more ancient species, or salmonids, I should say, that had already moved into those habitats and were primed to be able to move in to new habitats as those glaciers received. And I put this slide in here just because it shows you this cool example of what's called glacial melt. Uh, so upstream, like down below this picture, there's a glacier melting and, and they have this amazing color, this turquoise. They, they, waters that receive the glacial runoff have this extraordinary kind of luminescent color that you see here. The other thing you can see here is a U-shaped valley, which is characteristic of glaciation. As glaciers retreated, they carved out the landscape leaving these U-shaped patterns, which you see all throughout the Sierra Nevada, as opposed to V-shaped valleys or, or wine glass valleys, which have a much steeper slope and which are carved by, by um, streams. So the original distribution of uh, genus Oncorhynchus, which includes the steelhead, the chum, the sockeye, the uh, king salmon, and the silver salmon, which we're all going to talk about today. We've already talked about silver salmon, or excuse me, we've already talked about steelhead. Steelhead and rainbow trout are basically the same organism with a gene that switches on and off to allow them to take advantage of changing conditions and go out to sea or not. Um, but the original historic distribution of these species was the whole North Pacific Rim from Japan on up to what's now Siberia, up into the Arctic Circle, Alaska and the Bering Sea, all the way down to California. And um, one of the things to note is that, and I just mentioned this, is that climate in California is extremely variable. So this is done from a paper from, taken from a paper by Dettinger, in which he evaluated um, variability in precipitation along 60 year increments. And so you can see basically, if it's got a red color, it's reasonably low variability and you kind of know what you're gonna get. On the East Coast, variability is pretty low. It's kind of standard, at least it has been historically. Um, in, as you move West, uh, it, and variability increases. As you hit California, the variability is extraordinary from year to year, decade to get, decade and season to season. And in a lot of ways, this typifies a Mediterranean climate. We have a drought that hits us every year, lasts about six, seven months. And in between, on top of that seasonal drought, we have annual droughts, decadal droughts, possibly even mega droughts that last for hundreds of years that we haven't experienced yet. So salmon were primed to be able to take advantage of this uh, unique habitat. And one of the ways that they evolved to manage such a complex landscape or waterscape is by having uh, a sort of diverse, um, diverse strategies for moving upstream, for returning from the sea and utilizing the river at different times, depending on what niche was available. So this, uh, this plot here shows you um, the spawning times for different, essentially different races of king salmon in California. We have four different runs, and these are called evolutionary significant units. And one way to think about them is like subspecies or maybe emerging species, uh, or in some cases, declining species. So uh, a species that started to branch off and form a subspecies that started to form its own significant unit, its own population, which may be in recession now. And, and in fact, if you look at the if you look at this, the winter run, the spring run, uh, and the steelhead to a level, well, steelhead are controversial, but the winter run and spring run uh, kings are um, 
are definitely in, 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 no longer successful because of anthropogenic lens changes to the landscape. But the point I wanted to make about this is that the fall run, the fall run main spawn time on the river is offset from the late fall run which is offset from the winter run, which takes advantage of different conditions up in the mountains and the spring run. And then steelhead are, are coming in uh, around uh, early winter and taking advantage of habitats along the coast. And so, um, so the point is that this sort of, you know, this sort of uh, diversity creates a, a kind of, um, I'll come back to this idea, but a kind of portfolio of uh, opportunism that allows them to take advantage of different habitats under different conditions. So let me run through some of the um, some of the species. Uh, huh, that's interesting. Coastal cutthroat trout. I didn't really want to talk about coastal cutthroat trout, but I'll let you know that it's here. Um, <laughs> coastal cutthroat tr trout is a species that um, there's not that much known about it. Actually, it has a pretty limited distribution on the on the west coast here, from California up to Alaska. It doesn't occur except in the northern part of California. And they tend to occupy coastal streams. Um, they're very similar in, in a lot of ways to rainbow trout, but they have a sort of brassy color. Um, and as I said, not that much is known about them. Um, and they tend to be, not much is known about them. Their populations are small, fragmented. They kind of resemble trout in a lot of ways, but they are anadromous. And they depend on estuaries, especially bar-built estuaries on the coast. By bar-built, I mean on coastal rivers and creeks. Seasonally, you get the sandbar that builds up, which blocks the estuary from the creek from exchanging water directly with the ocean. And so they'll often, often um, fry or, um, or smolts will come out and they'll over summer in the estuary waiting for it to blow open with the fall rains. And this often puts them now at peril because estuary, these estuaries tend to be sort of degraded either because they don't get many flows and so they don't break till later in their life cycle which is later in the season, which means they have to over summer for a longer period of time. Or um, there's just a loss of vegetation, you know, because the riparian corridors have been logged and destroyed because of sediment coming downstream. And so there's, you know, the impacts on these lagoons and, and estuaries are pretty severe. And so not much is known about it. I'm kind of curious about them. I'd like to do some work on them. Um, pink salmon has a really, really wide distribution. Pink salmon are kind of the engine of productivity up in the up in the uh, both in the Pacific Northwest and in Russia, um, you can see that in the black stipples here is their native range, and you can see they've been introduced all over the world, including on the Great Lakes, where they have a self-sustaining population that migrates up into the rivers, and essentially they're a landlocked anadromous species. Um, these are the smallest and also the most abundant of the uh, Pacific salmon. They, um, they have a kind of two year life cycle and um, the males develop this like amazing hump on their back that you can see here. Whoops, sorry about that. I won't do that again. So this amazing back and which is characteristic of a lot of sam spotting salmon, although it's very pronounced in the, in the stinky pinks. And then they have this uh, really pronounced rostrum or kite. Uh, which is thought to be maybe a secondary sexual characteristic or some kind of a sexual display, something they use to fight off other males that are um, trying to spawn with a female. This animal is a mainstay of Pacific fisheries. Um, and so just some quotes, some numbers here, 260 million fish in 2010. That was 400,000 metric tons. And about a, it's about split more or less evenly from from uh, Russia and from the USA. Um, if you buy Verbot canned salmon, there's a good chance it was, it was a pink salmon. Uh, a lot of people locally don't like to eat them because they say, Brian's smiling, because <laughs> they say the flesh is kind of, um, it's kind of mushy. Um, it doesn't, it actually, um, you just have to eat them very, very fresh. They're so good actually when they're eaten fresh. But by the time they, are frozen and thawed and transported. They don't taste as good. And so they just, they don't, they don't handle well, but they do make good canning salmon. And there are canneries all up and down the Pacific Northwest that um, send them off to market. Um, we have had some scattered reports of pink salmon coming down as far as California, down to the Salinas River and Lagunitas Creek, which we'll talk about later, which is in Marin County. 
And um, this is an example. These strays are an example of, of essentially a species putting out propagules opportunistically to capitalize on changing environments. All the salmon do this. We often have strays from almost all the runs show up in California, even though it's well outside of their range. So another species is chum salmon. Um, these also have a, a widely overlapping range with the pinks. And um, they too have been introduced in various spots around the world. Um, they're also called dog salmon or kita salmon. I think they're called dog salmon because I, I wanted to put a picture in here, but um, I think uh, white observers noticed that they would cut off the heads and then slice them in half and dry them. Uh, the native, native groups that relied on them for their dogs. And so they became known as dog salmons. But dog salmons are actually amazingly good eating as well. In fact, on a fishing boat in Alaska, I made more money than I ever made in one day. <laughs> fishing dog salmon off Kodiak Island. It was an extraordinary day. We had a seining boat and we just scooped thousands of fish over and over again out of the water. And we made well over a thousand dollars in about, I don't know, eight hours for the period of the opener. It was pretty fun. Uh, and they're pretty striking fish. Again, they have the humpback, they've got the kipe and the jaws, which that structure, these are characteristics of so their sexually they're sexually secondary, sexual secondary, bleh, secondary sexual characteristics or primary or sexual, sexual display characteristics that emerge when they return to fresh water. So at, at sea, they look very silvery and streamlined. They all develop these characteristics, including the intense colors uh, as they run back upstream. Uh, dog salmon are characteristic. They have these weird purple blotches. They almost like tiger stripes or something on them, blurry blue and green and purple, so they're very striking. And they've been seen down here in California as well. I guess in 2017, we found several of them in Lagunitas Creek. That's something I really like to see. They have an amazing range, right? So they range all over the Pacific Ocean, and then they go way up the Yukon River and deep into the Yama River in Asia. And people who are living, um, who have a uh, basically a sustenance lifestyle, you know, basically, they rely on this return to survive each year. They take them, they harvest them, they smoke them. They use the heads for their dogs. They use the rest for themselves. Uh, it's part of annual cycle of life. And you can see these fish come way inland on the Yukon River up in uh, Canada. Sockeye salmon uh, also have a strong overlapping uh, range and they've also been introduced to different sites globally around the world. Sockeye are unique because they have a slightly different life history. They require their anatomists, but they require lake support, lake habitat for juvenile development. So they only move up rivers that have a lake up at the headwaters and then have small tributaries. And so they go up into those tribs where they lay eggs and then they, uh, the juveniles come downstream and develop in the lake before moving outstream into the ocean uh, environment. And these are really striking fish because they have these green heads and these red bodies. And so they're easy to spot and identify once they're moving up river. Um, and this was the, um, I should say that this is the, uh, the, I mentioned the Bristol Bay fishery up in Alaska. The Bristol Bay fishery is probably the, one of the, the, the biggest remaining fisheries in the world. And um, it, it's, it's just an extraordinary event how many fish come back in this month long period and people stay out there on those little boats that I mentioned for about a month, six weeks on those boats without ever getting off and they uh, gill net them out there. Oh, and here on the bottom I put 2010 harvest, 170,000 tons, um, just up in Alaska primarily. Oh, we have some landlocked uh, kokanee, so uh, when you hear kokanee, it's basically, it's a landlocked uh, um, sockeye salmon. Uh, these, we have kokanee that have been introduced up to Lake Tahoe, and actually this time of year, I believe you can go up and see them spawning. They live in the lake, that's their ocean environment. They spawn up the tribs, and you can actually go up to a couple streams in Tahoe and see them doing their thing. It's kind of a cool thing to do. We also have them up in Lake Berryessa, and they're stocked. In fact, they're stocked at various sites all around California as a game fish. 
coho salmon or silver salmon. These are, um, again, you can see the distribution and the spread across the world of these fishes. Uh, silver salmon, Oncorhynchus kasuch. These fishes are, um, these fishes are largely confined to um, coastal streams with deep headwater forests, old growth forests. And so those old growth forests provide habitat that keeps the water cold uh, and allows for them to successfully survive up there. Once logged, uh, the water temperatures raise, the streams get uh, silted in. Uh, once dams are put in, spawning grounds are no longer available. In short, logging, dams, agriculture have really undermined coho salmon habitat. Um, they're really beautiful fish. They're quite large. Um, and we, <laughs> they have, you can, if you're, if you've ever find out, if you ever find one out in the ocean, you can, you're fishing for them. You can tell, you can tell um, which they are by counting dorsal and anal fin rays, which you're, if you're in the lab, you're familiar with that. Uh, another way to tell is the gill rakers are pretty rough and they're widely spaced. Once they come up river though, it's pretty easy to tell. The spawning males have this dark red color with a slight green on the back and head. The females are a little more olive color, but they have this sort of blush of, of red as well. Um, California's the southernmost range of the population. And, um, and while they're adapted to extreme coastal conditions, they're very much in peril. In California, we've got two evolutionary significant units that is distinct subpopulation type units. Um, one is the, the Sonk, the Southern Oregon, Northern California coast, which has been listed as threatened as of 2005. And the other is the Central Coast ESU, which extends from Humboldt County down to the San Lorenzo and Santa Cruz County. And it's been classified as endangered species. Basically, California is feeling, you know, in addition to the intense landscape features that have changed, California is also feeling the effects of climate change. And so the species at the southern end of the range are probably most impacted by that. And we see the, we see the coho salmon range uh, contracting up, uh, retreating from the effects of climate change uh, up, up northward. Um, so, Typically, uh, coho salmon are very tied into the early fall rains, like what we just had should be a very important trigger for coho populations all up and down uh, the Pacific coast here. Um, and again, we need that first flush of rain to wipe out the bars on some of these coastal streams to allow passage. Uh, and so um, Right about now, there are streams in California where you can go see this. And one in particular that I really recommend going to check out, and I'm going to send you some information about this for extra credit trip, is Lagunitas Creek in Marin County, which has probably the most visible uh, run of coho salmon that, that you can readily see from a trail. Um, uh, the juveniles overwinter in these streams, then come out in early spring before the, the rivers close up or the streams close up. Um, and then after they enter the ocean, the salmon tend to remain inshore, close to the parents' parental stream, the natal stream, but then moving upward and feeding on the continental shelf. And they're really reliant on cold water upwelling. So upwelling is this process off the coast here where winds drive the movement of water away from the coasts. And as that happens, cold water upwells from the bottom and it brings with it all these nutrients and the nutrients fuel um, these strong blooms of phytoplankton and zooplankton productivity that then feed a whole food web. During El Nino periods, that engine, that circulation tends to shut down. And as a result, it has a strong impact on uh, survivorship from the ocean. And we've had a string since about 1981, we've had an increasing number of El Ninos. And this is kind of concurrent with a shifting um, shifting climate, right? And so coho, cohos have also been impacted by this change in ocean circulation patterns. And so I just, here you can see the, here you can see the graph. Um, this is the total number of recurring coho on the West Coast. And, and the thing to note here 
is this is the scale here on the left. This is a logarithmic scale. So the decline has gone from hundreds of thousands, maybe 500,000 fishes moving up into the streams. Uh, actually, that would be more like, yeah, that'd be about 500,000, uh, probably 600,000, 700,000. It's about 600 today. And, um, <clears throat> and again, this was like a major landscape feature, right? It was, temp it was temporal, it was ephemeral, but it was a major landscape feature when all these fish came up and packed these little tiny creeks that you could just kind of hop over and see nothing but a train of salmon going for it. And that's pretty much lost. And we don't, they're, you know, they're subject to so many stressors uh, that it's, in fact, the most recent one that I just heard about is that um, some of the byproducts of tires, the things that keep tires sticky and, and, and keep the integrity of tires, this chemical byproduct is, um, gets released onto the roads. Cars are very dirty for a variety of reasons. They release all kinds of chemicals, not just oil products, but also byproducts of plastic and, and, this, and the tires. That stuff is extremely toxic to coho salmon. And so a lot of restorations up in Washington have been trying to like integrate urban streams into like the more natural landscapes. So they've done a whole bunch of urban restoration. And what that's done is bring fish right up into urban areas where traffic concentration is higher and the probability of being poisoned and disrupted is higher as well. In a very ironic and bitter story about the efforts of, of restoration. So it's also sort of a cautionary note about unintended consequences in this business. Um, this is Lagunitas Creek. Uh, you really can walk up and see this. You, know, you look down on the trail and you can see the fish down there. You have to, um, you have to call ahead. I'll send out some information. I think you have to call ahead to see if they're guiding trips out of there or if it's, um, if it's um, been closed, what the deal is right now. The population was very, very tenuous a few years ago. And then I think in 2018, we had a really strong year class comeback. So there's some hope for it. And it spawned its own, uh, spawned, it spawned its own uh, restoration council. That's the Salmon Protection and Watershed Network in Marin County that organizes a lot of the local efforts to try to keep Lagunitas Creek alive. And just, just spatially, so you can place this, Lagunitas Creek empties out in Tamales Bay. So it's in West Marin, really beautiful spot. And then finally, Chinook salmon. I have just a few minutes left to talk about Chinook. Um, again, the same story of local versus introduced populations across the world. These are the largest of the salmon. They're called king salmon. Um, <laughs> these, as I said, they tend to be larger. They're the more drabber of the species, but they have an impressive size. They also have a very diverse life history. So um, in addition to the different races that I talked about, the different runs upriver, they also have uh, different times that they might spend at sea. So in this case, a fully grown male, three years old, before returning back to its natal stream, spends about a year and a half at sea. Um, there's a jack male or a jill female, jacks and jills, um, are returners who essentially come back in two years instead of three years. And they there's also precocious par males. Precocious pars never leave the river. They stay in river and they spawn within a year's time. And again, these different life histories have evolved to take advantage of shifting conditions. It could be that it's advantageous for a fish to leave the ocean after two years because an El Nino hits in the third year. And so that lucky fish gets to come back and it helps to sustain the population. You can imagine that if we only had three year bites for the population coming back every three years without a lot of straying between years, you'd sort of have a bottleneck population. This is a way that the population essentially maintains diversity and genetic diversity and plasticity. Um, you can see them spawning if you go up, check out this website. Um, so there's four main runs. I talked to this, I talked to this a, a little bit before, but the fall run, the late fall run, the winter run, and the spring run are all timed at different times of year. So for example, the fall run tends to come out. The peak migration is happening, kind of tapering off right now. I think we got a big pulse probably here in the last few days because of all the, the movement. 
but there's still some action going on at the hatcheries. And then the spawning for these fishes, once they've migrated upstream, tends to be from October to November. So there's still this month, I think there's a good chance to see them up at the hatcheries. And the juveniles reside in the stream for a variable amount of time before flowing back out. These are low elevation. This is a low elevation run. Basically, they're adapted to living, spawning in the main stem of the Sacramento River. This is in contrast to, the, to say, the spring run. The spring runners tend to migrate up in May and June, and they oversummer in the river. And then they spawn up in September. And the strategy here is that they go up. These are high elevation spawners. So prior to dam building, they used to go way, way up into the mountains, especially off the San Joaquin River. Winter run, same kind of life strategy, but instead of the San Joaquin River, they tended to head up the Sacramento, up by the McLeod River and the Pitt River, all the way up into the Cascades. And the strategy in both of their cases is to come in to the river and hold, the springers hold until the first flush of rains and they go as far up into the mountains where they can get really cold, clear water, way, way up high, escape from predators, find their specific habitat. And then the babies, the juveniles, can overwinter, in the case of springers, can spend the first year of their life up in the river before they find an opportunity to escape. Winter do that as well. These, uh, okay, so hold that thought. This, this different strategies of using different parts of the river at different times of the year and trying to poise yourself to be available is called the portfolio effect. So each run might go up and down and vary in time, but if you average them together, it means that more or less, the species is a better chance of surviving. Um, and so on average, this is a portfolio effect. It's actually copped from investors who like, you know, for your retirement, you're supposed to have like a portfolio of different investments. You know, you invest in stocks, which are long-term, you invest in Apple, which is like big return, but it's really expensive. Me, I only invest in green stuff, which means I'll live in a rented house forever. But yeah, anyway, this is the portfolio effect. Oh, and here's the, here's the, here's the, here's where it got copped from. You know, you invest in stocks and bonds, something I've never been very good at. Um, but in spite of this, um, this portfolio effect, some of the runs have been so impaired that it's really reduced genetic diversity. So in this case, the winter run and the spring run have all but bombed. And you can imagine why. In the case of the winter run, the winter run last summer didn't even spawn at all. Can you guess why? There's no time to guess. The Shasta Dam, the Shasta Dam blocks the Sacramento River. Previously, from the olden days, they would have gone right up the Pitt River, way up into the Cascades. They can't access it now. There's no fish ladder. And there's no, if the dam is so enormous, there's really no passage either going or coming. And so what they use for summer, oversummering habitat, it's, it's no longer a great strategy to oversummer in the river. Because where are you going to find cold water way down in the valley? It's blazing hot. It was blazing hot during the last drought. This last summer set all kinds of records. Where is their only source of cold water? At the foot of Shasta Dam, which has a cold water pool that it releases to maintain this population. So in addition to providing water for agriculture and drinking water in urban areas. They also have to manage the, 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 the releases for salmon. But this year, have you seen pictures of what happened to the Shasta Reservoir? It's basically a river. The cold water pool disappeared. <clears throat> the winter run tanked. Again, this has happened before. They're only, they were only um, able to spawn in hatcheries with air coolers or with water coolers. Um, if not for that, the population, at least for this year, would have died and for previous years. So um, I'll pick this up a little bit on Friday. Thank you.